said governorship debate organized by Channels Television and its partners, the Civil Society Election Situation Room, in conjunction with the UK Aid, with support from UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. We are live in Akura, the Ondo State Capital. This is the Sunshine State. Ondo is known for its endowment in natural and human resources, and no doubt the reason for the contest for the state's number one position, the governorship seat. Tonight, two candidates out of the three invited will be talking to millions of people on their vision, programs, and agenda and how they hope to achieve them if elected as governor of Undo State on Saturday. There are set rules and guidelines for this debate. The candidates are aware and have agreed to those guidelines. This two-hour debate is divided into segments, governance, welfare of the people, job security, social development, and the economy. Let me state at this point that none of these candidates or their campaigns are aware of the questions. The audience here in this auditorium have also agreed to remain silent. Well, don't worry, whatever you may be watching us tonight, you can also follow this broadcast across all our social media platforms and a part of the conversation. You can watch us live on our website. It is channelstv.com. We are also live on Facebook and on Twitter. Twitter is using the hashtag, hashtag Ondo Debate 2020. Hashtag Ondo Debate 2020. In exception to the rule tonight of no jeering, no clapping, and no cheering, I will now uh, invite you to applaud uh, as an exception to one of the rules set tonight for this debate as I introduce the candidates in alphabetical order using their party acronym. Welcome the candidate of the All Progressives Congress and the Governor of Ondo State, Governor Rotimi Akiridolu. Of course, uh, we will have the candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Ayito Yo Jagade, in a short while. But before we get started, thank you so much, Governor Kiridolu, for coming tonight. Before we get started, let's get some remark from our partners, the co-convener of the election, Civil Society Election Situation Room, Esther Uzoma. May I, on behalf of the Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room, welcome everyone to the Governor State, to the Ondo State Governorship Debate. This debate is organized by the Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room in conjunction with our partners, Channel Television and UK Aid. This provides a platform for the candidates to once again tell the people of Ondo State their intentions for the next four years. Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room is happy to encourage the democratic processes to deepen democracy. And so today we encourage all citizens of Ondo states with their PVCs to come out on Saturday and mass and vote. For the candidates, I wish you well. To the people of this great state, the Sunshine State, I say, may your sun never set at noonday. Long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther Uzoma, for that opening remark. Um, I want to sincerely thank uh, Governor Kredulu for coming up tonight. I know it's a very busy time in your campaigns ahead of Saturday. We're still expecting uh, the candidate of the PDP to join us. So we'll set, he will join us in a short while, but we will continue. But let's now rise, everyone, for the Nigerian National Anthem.
Thank you so much, everyone. We would like to let you know that the candidates that will be on the stage tonight have been selected through a scientific process. And of course, uh, it's a, a polling process which eventually um, uh, birthed the candidates that were invited tonight. But we'll let you know that the candidate of the ZLP pulled out. But we have the candidates of the APC and the PDP tonight. Thank you so much, Governor Kiridulu, for coming. We will start, and you have the advantage of uh, coming early. Um, let's begin uh, with your opening uh, statement. I would like you, and that's going to be for three minutes, we'd like to know why you want to be the governor of Ondo State and why you think you are the best man for the job. Thank you. I, I, I'm the governor now. I know of us know. And all I, I'm trying to do now is to run for a second term. Well, with the work I've done in the over three and a half years since I've been here as governor of Ondo State, I believe that we've laid a very good foundation. But that notwithstanding, I believe that we still have a lot more to do. This state is changing for the better. And since we started this change, it is, I, I feel convinced that it is now a best interest of the state, it is an, a, in our best interest in Ondo State to have continuity so that a number of the work that we are set our hands on, we are, we are in position to complete them. And we have clear vision of where we are going. Uh, we are tested, we have been here in the saddle, and we have learned a lot during this process. And it's not something, what you gain being a governor, even for two years, is is great advantage over any other person. So for me, with this advantage, which is on our side, I believe that we should be able to at least serve the state one more time and at least take the state to the glorious height, which we always had in our focus all the time. All the time, I've always believed that Ondo State is blessed. We have everything. and. Yes, we needed very composed and focused leadership. And this, with all respect, and is not praising or trying to pick myself as if I'm the best, but with all respect, I believe that we have led in this direction, in a direction to ensure that Ondo State is on a better, better pedestal for the growth expected because things are changing in the world and on those states cannot sit back. So those states need a leader that can at least be part at the forefront of its development with the experience it has garnered so that you don't throw this away. And we have a lot of things we have put in place. How do we sustain it? The only way, sustainability for me, the only way for it is continuity. And that's why I felt, let us be here, do a little bit, spend another four years by the grace of God, and take on those states near the El Dorado. Uh, uh, nobody is going to say we will get there in four years. But I can assure you, things are changing in those states, and things will change for the better in those states if we have another four years. All right. Thank you. Um, interesting. You've spent the first three minutes to give us your opening statement. But I'll give you another three minutes to tell us what would you do within your first 100 days in office? Uh, should you be elected? Um, you are serving a four-year term now. Should you be elected? What's your plan and your agenda in the first 100 days? Let me, let me be fair to myself and to people who are listening to us. I am one of those people who is not guided by this timing. I, I, don't, I don't believe in it, seriously. Because you come in, in 100 days, I don't need to rush things. But there are many things that are in the pipeline that at the end of the day will almost wrap within the first 100 days. 
I spread, for instance, in the first 100 days in office, that our air powder plant in Emurele should be up. I spread, for instance, in our first 100 days, that we should have had the port declaration and advertised for a port. I expect, for instance, that with hard work on the side, that within the first 100 days, we will, there are roads that we have yet to complete. We should be able to complete the Idori Idoka Road within our first 100 days because it has gone to an advanced stage. There are other roads that we are working on that I believe we should be able to complete. So there are numerous things we need to do or that we are doing. So I, I'm not going to be pigeon old in 100 days, but I know that since we are working, it is uh, the, to the advantage of the state and our own advantage too that a number of processes that, that we have in place will be completed within the first 100 days. I can assure you that a number of classrooms, because we are already taking uh, what I will call uh, a, we are paying our matching grant on suburb project, and within three months, when we come in, a number of classrooms will have been completed. So quite a number of things can be done in the first 100 days. But I can assure you, I cannot just say this, this. There is no, I, I'm not heading for a particular da target. I'm not new on the seat. I'm not new in the saddle. It is just for continuity, and that is it. All right, um, because you have the advantage of being the only man on the stage right now. I like you uh, to sell for free your agenda and manifesto, uh, your roadmap for this second term that you are conversing for to the people of uh, Ondo State. You have two minutes to do that. For the first time? No, no, you, I'm talking about the, your manifesto right. for uh, the second term. You are seeking, you're converting for a second term in office, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, it is not going to be different from what I sold to the people of this state in my first term. And there are five. J, M, P, P, R. There's no difference. I'm going to pursue it with everything that I have. The only difference, little one, is that there are a number of changes. And having been in the saddle, and I've been working with uh, uh, at neck level, of that National Economic Council level of the country. It has done on us, and all of us have accepted that we must move very swiftly towards zero oil economy. And that is probably an addition to it. Something has to be done. Oil will not be, the, will not be everything again in the, in the country. It's almost even not only drying up, but it is not as profitable as we always thought it was. So with, with oil, zero oil economy, that is one of our targets. And that since I had said that in my, uh, my earlier program, or what you call my manifesto, I said to them that, look, job creation through agriculture, uh, industrialization, and entrepreneurship, so it keyed in into what now has become the in thing that we now have to have agroeconomy so that we not only grow what we eat, we only eat what we grow. So on those state must be involved in it totally. So that's why I believe that our, our focus, our target, our trajectory now is on agri and zero oil economy, and that will be explained as we go along. Thank you so much, Governor Kredolu, uh, for those uh, 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 thoughts. Uh, let me tell everyone that the candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Mr. Ejita Ojagede, has arrived. Thank you so much for coming. I know how difficult it is at this time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Shu. Right, we've started before you entered, but let's get your opening statement. Why do you think you are the man for the job? In three minutes, your opening statement. Thank you very much. I do apologize for this late coming. We had to do some rallies, and uh, it's part of the season. Now, I have a private sector experience spanning my entire legal practice period. I have also a span of public service experience for just seven and a half years when I served as the Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice in Ondo State. 
I had the benefit of looking at what operates in the private sector and the public sector. I know things are not going too well, and I believe there's need for us to have a new face and a new positive change. I believe the time has come for us to have a more holistic, honest, and practical view at governance. What I intend to do by the grace of God and why I think I should be considered is one, because I intend to grow the economy. I know there are challenges in the health sector and intend to confront it. Health, I intend to confront it. Now, I do know that the health facilities in those states is not in a good shape. And in the last three and a half years, we have suffered a reversal. The mother and child hospital, the free maternity services for our pregnant women, the high cost of Medicare is something that bothers me. I intend, by the grace of God, to have a new positive way to address things. In the educational sector, I know that our tertiary institutions are in a bad state. The university education has become too costly for our people in Ondo State. Our industry here is education. When we're in government as Attorney General, the cost of tuition fees is just 25,000 Naira to 30,000 Naira. As soon as this government came in, it was increased to 150,000 Naira per each university student. Unfortunately, we are at the receiving end. I intend by the grace of God to bring this down and also ensure that we have jobs for our youth by engaging the private sector. I intend to deal with the agri sector in a fresh new way by taking the sense of our farmers and seeing what way they can increase their output. First, so that we can have food security, secondly, provide employment, and thirdly, have serve the industries which we intend to put in place. We know it's difficult for government to do it alone. We intend to engage the private sector in doing this. These are part of why I think I should, I'm qualified and competent to be there at this time. And I believe that governance is a continuous process. Whatever good things this government is doing, we'll continue with it and we improve on it. We bring new ideas and fresh ideas that will bring honesty into governance. Thank you, Shim. Thank you so much. Uh, that takes us to, of course, you have opportunity to rebut uh, one another. Uh, but we'll take a break. And when we come back, we focus on the economy. The plans of both men on the stage for the people of Ondo State in their manifesto, how they hope to solve some of the economic problems of the state. That's going to be next when we return, everyone. Join us again. Thank you so much and welcome back. We're now going to focus on the economy with the candidates that are here tonight. Uh, for the Ondo State Governorship Debate, the candidate of the APC, Governor Ruti Miyakure Dolu, and the candidate of the PDP, uh, Mr. Ejitayo Jagede. Thank you so much. Senior Advocate of Nigeria, both of them are on the stage today. Uh, we started with you earlier, Governor Akure Dolu, but I think we, we should begin with you this time around, uh, Mr. Uh, Jagede. How do you plan to raise the revenue of the state without increasing taxes? Excuse me? How do you plan to raise the revenue of the state without increasing taxes? Thank you very much, Shil. For any government, funding is quite key and important. Relying on federal allocation every time does not serve any purpose. The primary objective is to ensure that we make every person to do honor his civic responsibility. And that means that each and every one of us must be able to pay what I call very reasonable taxes that are not duplicated or multiplied. We intend, by the grace of God, to ensure that we encourage our people to voluntarily pay their taxes and have a database for all those who are doing business, and also encourage all the organizations where you have businessmen who are involved, like the artisans, to sit down together and work with government in a way that they will be able to pay their taxes reasonably throughout the year. In other words, we intend to open as much as possible the net for the taxes so that each and every of our citizens joyfully pays his tax, no matter how small. If you have many of them in the tax portfolio, then we'll be able to increase the tax revenue for the state. I think more importantly, we have to be focused on ensuring that we plug all leakages in government spending and government funding. That in itself is a way to conserve funds. Where you have employees of federal government and banks also, who are resident within the state, we want to ensure that we have all of them 
honor their civic responsibility to the state. And all our industries also, those who are coming in, in respect of setting up new industries, will have tax exemption for the company, but not tax exemptions for their employees. By so doing, we also be able to draw in other funds from those who are employed in private sector, because public sector by law have their taxes deducted from source. In other words, thank you, Mr. Yes. Jagede. Thank you very much. Your time is up. Uh, Governor Akredalu, uh, same question. How do you hope uh, to raise the revenue of the state without increasing taxes? Thank you. I, what I want to put on the table is my record of achievement in improving the idea of the state. Whether you claim you are not directly the captain of the ship, or if you, have, if you work in that ship, you are expected to have assisted in that ship. What I will say is this. We came in here and the revenue of Ondo State, IDR, was between five to seven hundred million naira per month. We have improved on it. We have gotten to a level in which today we are grossing averagely two billion naira per month in Ondo State. It is an achievement. It's, n it's never been like that before. So we have in place today a mechanism that is working. And I'm, I'm sure because by the time we started, we started, got to 1 billion, 1.5 billion, 2 billion. So it's going to continue to increase. And how do you want to increase it? Or how did we do it? We have today a, a, a very robust in, in, in internal revenue services. The building is right opposite here. I, we constructed it in our own time. We have today employed over 400 graduates who are deployed to all internal revenue uh, offices all over local governments, and they are working. So we have a new internal revenue services that is geared and that, is, that has achieved, and that is the important thing that look. We are already there. We are moving. All we are doing now, we will continue to do it and add more. That is what I can say. We have achieved from five to seven hundred million naira to two billion per annum per your time, month. Your time is up. Uh, let me uh, on this issue of um, uh, taxes also. Uh, this very un uh, question we take a minute to answer, and uh, I'll begin. Uh, do you think that there are people in the state who are not captured yet, or do you uh, think that you need to tax people more? because of the dwindling resources coming from the federal location, how, how do you hope that taxation can be maximized in the state? you have a minute? I don't think it is appropriate to impose heavy tax on individuals. The areas which I intend to look at again are the areas of our resources. Cocoa, for instance, in respect of the grading, there are a lot of leakages in taking our cocoa out of Ondo State. Even for the forestry, there are a lot of leakages in taking our woods out of the forest without taxes. These two areas are areas that are potential sources of revenue for government. They are the areas which I intend to look at. Now, I believe others who have not captured is because we have not appealed to them. We will continue to sensitize them and appeal to them to be part of the civic position of government to draw in more funds. Yes. Uh, Governor Kirudulu, same question. Uh, do you think there are people in this state that are not captured in the tax net? And uh, if so, uh, do you believe that you earn more, you pay more? Is that your policy? Well, One minute, please. Well, let me say this. There were people in these states that were not in the tax net. When we came in, we found a way to bring them in. That's what led to the increase. It's not imposing every tax in any way. But we found ways of bringing those who are not in the tax net in, and we found ways of blocking those leakages. We did this successfully, and that is what has given rise to our IGR. And to note this, we were awarded a prize as a state, as the best growing state in Nigeria under, under IGR. So in our time, we know what we are doing. It's that we have the experience, and we are capable of doing it. We will increase it. 
If but for COVID, we probably have gone into, got into about 2.5 billion or going, going to 3 billion per, per month. So we are set to do it. We are doing it and we'll do it successfully. So we know those who are not in the trust for now. Okay. Uh, let's go into one very fundamental uh, part of the economy of this state, which a lot of this state is very popular for it, and it's the uh, issue of cocoa. Uh, Ondo State is a major cocoa producer. Uh, how much of this do you think you can exploit or explore uh, should you be elected as governor? Well, basically, Ondo State produces on the average 40% of the entire output of this country. And this is because our farmers before now were encouraged to go into cocoa production. Unfortunately, this has gone down, depleted in some way, because of migration from the farm to the cities. Secondly, again, because the high productivity of cocoa in terms of seedlings that we used to enjoy is no longer there. What I intend to do, by the grace of God, is to ensure that we make cocoa more profitable. A lot of our cocoa are turning into trees, wild trees, in the forest. If you go between Akure and Ondo, to your left and to your right, you find a lot of cocoa trees that are overgrown. And you find a lot of them also already abandoned. What I think should be done, and what we intend to do, is to ensure that we also take a census of our cocoa farmers. Thereafter, we bring in new seedlings for them. I found from my experience and practical experience, I saw new trees of cocoa with the seedlings that are coming up just at the foot of the trees. And it now takes, on the average, lesser period right. for cocoa to grow. Like, and I believe that yeah. cocoa production is something that should be encouraged. Thank yeah. you. Governor Akiridulu, how much of the cocoa production potential have you been able to utilize and take advantage of Thank since you. you became governor? Thank you so much. Since we became governor, we have directed our efforts at increasing our output in cocoa. And it's there for everybody to see. So whatever my brother is talking about, I think that we have done and we have gone past that, that we want to have record of cocoa farmers, we have done all those things. Today, I remember from record, our the age, the, the sage of Bafem Olowo cultivated about 2,000 hectares. We wanted to cultivate 2,000, but in partnership with the CBN, we increased it to 8,000 hectares for cocoa in Juberi. And in a time, we have, we have given to farmers over 2 million seedlings, improved seedlings of cocoa, free of charge, so that our cocoa output will increase. All this we are doing, we are ready, and cocoa is there for us, and we are set, set to make sure that these cocoa products will be used for good purposes. All right. Yet another part of the economy of this state that a lot of people may not know or may know is the potential of bitumen uh, in this state. Ondo um, State has one of the largest deposits of bitumen in the country. Uh, let me ask, uh, do you have this in your plan, Mr. Jagede, uh, and how do you hope to take advantage of this in two minutes? Through public-private partnership. Bitumen deposits are found in Odibo local governments, in Udele local governments, and part of SLD local governments. They are large deposits. My understanding is that it's been so difficult for previous governments to exploit because of the high capital nature of the processes. And Canadian experience appears to be the best. And again, because it is part of extractive minerals, you need the concurrence of the federal government in terms of license to be able to do it. Interestingly, the government has a company that I'm sure has a license before now to develop bitumen. The bitumen production, because of the technical nature, is one that you need perfectly private sector experience and help from developed countries for you to be able to extract and process. Canada experience, for instance, would be a very good one. And I have in mind to diligently, hopefully, and transparently bring in investors that will be able to look at our bitumen reserves and process them for the economy of the state. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Jagere. Governor Kredulu, same question, bitumen. What have you done with it? Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, why has it been difficult to take advantage of this opportunity bitumen provides? Two minutes. So, let me tell you, it has not been difficult. And I'm rather surprised that my colleague here has not, is, is not found it right to give due credit 
you, it needs, you need to accept facts. You must give due credit. Since Ondoste was created, people have labored and labored. But in our own time, in our own very time, bitumen exploration has started. We are the ones that facilitated it. On those states, had licenses, but those licenses were not. We have licenses, but we got people. Southwest bitumen today is there in Ireli for exploration, not only for mining, but exploration of bitumen. And let me say this clearly: if my brother does not know, Canadian experience cannot work in Nigeria. It cannot, and I repeat it: it cannot, because we know that it cannot, and we have gone to German something to produce. All right. Let me allow, allow the equipment for bitumen exploration. No right. Canadian instrument cannot work here. Let, let me allow you one minute uh, a rebuttal on that. So, you know, I, I don't have, I've not been a governor before. Mr. Kiru has been a governor for the past three and a half years. He did say that cocoa output has improved. It has not. Cocoa production in the United States has gone down in the last three and a half years. And he spoke about bitumen. He said Canadian experience cannot work. And they're already exploiting or exploring bitumen. I don't think so. I don't think it is correct that this government is already exploring bitumen or exporting bitumen or producing bitumen. If they are producing bitumen, where are the bitumen? Where is it? We have contractors all over the They still bring this bitumen from outside. I said bitumen is from Italy. I have not seen it. And you've mentioned cases of cocoa production has been, is, is, is improved. I have not seen the improvements. I have not seen the bitumen. We are all going through the same experience. We are outside, but we know what is happening inside. All right. Uh, Governor Kredelu, one minute to rebut. Well, well um, it's just, um, I pity my, my brother. Since he says he has not seen it, there's nothing I can do. But it, the evidence is there. This was done to the full glare of the whole world when Southwest Beachmen moved into a relay for exploration for the first time in this country. If anybody in this state now claim that he has not seen it, then there's a problem. We have a problem. Not even an educated person will say he has not seen it. It's there for everybody to see. So for me, we mixing bitumen with cocoa does not make sense. I believe the issue of cocoa is different. I'm talking about cocoa. CBN is there to verify. I'm saying that we have started, we have had 2,000 hectares cleared, and cocoa is being planted, it's been planted there, and that with CBN, it was increased to 8,000, over 8,000 hectares. Uh, is there, I can see it. We haven't been the road to the, to the farm. So if he has not had the opportunity of going there, it's an unfortunate development. But I'm telling you facts. I'm giving figures that can be verified. Right. So I don't know what else. Your, your, your time is up. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think uh, you, maybe we've rested this, uh, Mr. Jagade. But let's look at the oil producing part of this state. Uh, Understood perhaps is the in, is in the league of the oil producing state and uh, uh, of the nine states in the country. A visit to some of the oil producing communities still show large amounts of underdevelopment or some cases of non-development in some areas at all. Mr. Jagada, uh, on this one, you have two minutes. You are part of the last administration. What did you do? And if you become governor, what do you intend to do in terms of development and in infrastructure in these oil producing areas of Ondo State? Well, I do know that the southern belt of the state have not had to, it too good. First, because basically there has been no power in that part of the state. And I cannot give credit to all our former governors or our serving governors. I have not been warned before. I have told the people in the southern belt that we intend to experience something new. And because basically I do appreciate the fact that uh, power is dominantly under what I call, it's under concurrent, but it's under also exclusive legislative list in that it's covered by national grid. But I think there's need for new experience. There are areas in this country that do not have national grid, yet they have light. All of us generate, transmit, and distribute power from our home. If you have a generator and you connect it to your house, it means you're generating power and you're distributing. But of course, there's need for us to have big machines and turbines. The street lights that you have in Ondo State are powered by private generators, by generators. And you have street lights all over the place, which, was, which came in the last administration. Now, there's need for us to set the southern area, the cities, into separate blocks and have small turbines that will facilitate power generation in conjunction with the local government and the local populace. 
Whoever is prepared to pay a little amount to assess that power should be given opportunity to assess power and you have light in those areas. There must be a starting point. You do not wait for many years. It's been like this for the past 15 years because our governors have not shown new experience and have not brought in fresh ideas into the need to have a certain part of the state have power. It's a very critical thing because you're underdeveloping the economy if that sector does not have light. Governor Gredo, look, the same question about the oil producing area of the state. Uh, I've asked him because he was, he's not been governor, uh, but the, 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 uh, the question for you on this area is, what have you done in the last four years and going forward, what do you intend to do should you be elected for the oil producing uh, areas of uh, Undo State? Right. Thank you. The oil producing areas of Undo State are clearly defined. And what we have done in most of these areas are infrastructural development. They are there for everybody to see. Let me even take one thing uh, that started with the last government. In most of our oil producing states, they don't have portable water to drink. And it's hard for them to sink well right about towards there. It was even more or less like commission. You commission a project without articulation, without necessary pumps, without anything. What we have done today is that we have gone ahead to ensure the pumps and everything necessary are there, and we have laid the pipes. So water from Abutu to the generality of areas of our producing states today is there, and they drink portable water. Then there are some few of the roads that we have done since we come, came into office. Go to Araromi and uh, uh, Leki, where we are constructing road from here to Ibeju Leki. We have started. Go into some other areas where we are working there. So for me, what, is, what has happened really is that we have done our best. If you talk about street light, street light, people should be, be, be truthful when you make statements on street light. They never had light for eight years when my brother was deputy governor. Eight years. We came in, and I can, I, can, I can say this and boast of it, that we needed to get all the transmission lines repaired. And with support of the Niger Delta Power Holding, I guess because, okay, we are the same government, Niger Delta Power Holding, we have gone into it. We have almost completed all the transmission lines. And from there, they have even signed an agreement right. with, to, to join with the motor show. So light is coming to the south very, very soon. Governor These Kredo, are all let, our let efforts. Let's uh, Let's, there's another very critical uh, two questions on the issue of the economy. But it's going to be a minute each for these questions. Uh, and they're very important. Um, well, this has to do with the social welfare of the people of the state. With the population of indigent citizens and the elderly in the state and the poverty level, would you consider giving stipends on monthly welfare support to this class of people? Well, before I go into that, I don't have a minute, let me say first that um, the issue of light in the South is something that is very important. Mr. Governor has been on the seat for this past three and a half years. There's no light in the South. Now, having said that, let me say that the elderly and the pregnant and those who are physically challenged are vulnerable in the society. And what I believe we should do is to ensure that we give them comfort and welfare. First of all, those who are elderly and who have been part of the civil service should end their pension, should end their gratuity. Because it's not a privilege, it is a right. And once you are able to take care of that sector, then you have taken care of some part of those elderly. Then in terms of stipend, once we are able to take a census of those old women and the funds are there, it would be an appropriate thing to do to give them some comfort. If there is no stipend, then we must ensure that right. their so children are given opportunity yeah. to have access to education. Uh, Governor Akredolu, same question. Indigent citizens and the elderly in the state with a poverty level, would you consider giving stipends monthly uh, welfare support to this class of people? Well, let me also start by this reporter. He said, I've been in office for three and a half years. He was part of a government that was there for eight years. For those eight years, the southern part of the state never had light. 
light did not blink. We have just come and we are saying that even before we end this first term, there will be light there because they have signed agreement with the motor shop and the transition lines are already completed. That's what we are saying. So if in eight years nothing was done, so, so I, don't, I, I don't know who is to blame really. But when, when you talk about the vulnerable, we are, we are working at them. That's why for us, when we talk about elderly, a number of them are through federal government today, they are having money paid to them monthly, every month. So the vulnerable ones, we are concerned about them, we are worried about them. Those who are vulnerable have access to free medical care. Those who are, uh, uh, what we call... Uh, just, uh, all right. Now, uh, the last very question on this issue of the economy has to do with the civil service in Ondo State. Uh, a large proportion of the expenditure of the state goes to servicing the civil service, uh, with people suggesting that the civil service strength, uh, the population might be larger than it can bear. What plans do you have to give a decent civil service or run a decent civil service in view of the income of Ondo State? One minute, please. I don't think the civil service is overbloated. I think it's a question of giving responsibility to those who are in the civil service. Take our engineers, for example. In, we intend to create gangs of engineers and divide the state into sectors where you have all our machineries refurbished and brought back to function. Once we do that, we will be able to engage the civil servants who also add to the productivity of government. I do not believe that is overbloated. I believe that we should give them responsibility. Governor. Governor Akeredolu, same question, please. Well, for me, we have, we have civil service that we are able to manage, and we are doing it successfully. Today, the number of our, what I would call culverts, the number of our bridges, that our engineers in Ministry of Wars constructed in our time, we never had water contract out. When we had this blast at Luabu, with this very, that destroys so many places there. The road is finished now. It was done by our Ministry of Work. We must give kudos to them. In our own time, we have encouraged them to do good work. And it's the only way to manage this service. We have given them what, what I would call the impetus. We have ensured that, look, we allow them to know that, look, we are good. And because we said to them, try this. When we, had, when we came in, over three bridges collapsed in Nikare at the same time. And I called the Minister of, Minister of Works. You must be able to do this. They went there, what they did. I don't see any other construction company that can do better. So when we have all these, first, all these areas that you bring in the civil service, you know that the civil service can still perform very right. well. So uh, I'll give a minute each for a butter to end this segment before we need to move into uh, another. Uh, I guess uh, maybe I should start with uh, Governor Akiridoli. You have a minute for butter. I guess he said something that you wish to respond to. Well, the only thing I want to respond to, I want to respond to is the issue of when we talk about areas of pension. Yes, the pensioners are entitled to their money. But when we came, the government in which he served was owing several areas of pension. We have had to pay them today. When we came, they never gave the civil servants any sense of belonging. He was part of that government, fully part of that government. He was one of only two who served there over seven years. Two of them served with Mumbuko over seven years. Now, when we came, the, the morale was very low. The civil servants were dying in droves because they were not paying their salaries. They were holding them over seven months' salary. So when we came, we had to pay to ensure that the civil servants get at least encouraged. And I think today they are living up to, the, to what we expect of them. The civil service today is different from what they have in Miracle's time. This time around, in his own time, when he was there in government, this time around, we are promoting civil servants. We right. haven't done promotion for Your 20, Dolo, your 20. time is up. You have a minute to, for the rebuttal. Yes, I, I do understand the emotions of uh, Mr. Governor about the fact that I served in an administration. I would love to be in his shoes. I would love to be a governor. And I would love people to compare what I would do in three and a half years to what he has done in the last three and a half years. It's, look, there's, only, there's only one governor. So there's no basis for comparing a commissioner with a governor. And I would try to talk about SLDO. In the last three and a half years, SLDO has not had any development, not from this administration. In the last three and a half years, years Elijah has never had any development, not from this administration. When we were there, 
the government which I serve, and I should also give credit to Dr. Mimiko. We had the first, the water in Abutu that he mentioned was the brainchild of that of government. All he said they did was reticulation. Which one did you do on your own? We had a mega school built in, S in SSLDO. We had food bridges built in SSLDO and in larger areas. Now, we had Osopadek functioning fairly well. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, things have gone down the drain. I would love Mr. Governor to point to what he has done specifically in the larger All right. SLD. Mr. Jagada, your, your time is up. Thank you very uh, much. We'll take a break. Point to it. Just can a moment. Point to we, 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 we need to, we are, we are okay. due for a break. Okay. We take a break, and when we come back, it's getting interesting in the conversation about ideas of how to move on those states forward. But when we come back, we turn to the issue of security, health, and education of on those states, and the ideas in moving these areas forward. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Thank you so much for staying with us, everyone, on this Ondo State Governorship debate. The governorship candidates of APC and PDP, they've been talking to us on their ideas for some of these issues we have posed tonight. Let's uh, talk about security. This time around, I'll be starting with Governor Akiridulu of the APC. As a lawyer, are you satisfied with the present structure of the country with regards to the power of the state government to secure itself? If not, how do you hope to fix this in ensuring the safety of lives and property of your people? Two minutes. Two minutes. So, I don't know whether you will allow me. Please, I think it is important for you to read out the ground rules again. You remember just now that there are people who came late here, as always, and they were clapping. And your rule four is that there won't be allowance for cheering, booing, or clapping in the course of debate. Maybe they don't know. It's important for you to tell them. It's not that people don't have supporters there they could be clapping to so, so that we don't have these rules broken with, without any respect. I believe that we are having a decent debate here and that if we have rules, we should keep by those rules. And I think it's important for you to announce it today. Thank you so much. Uh, perhaps I should also say uh, to everyone in the audience that the rule is that there won't be any clapping or any jeering or cheering within uh, this uh, time that we are having this conversation so that we can hear the ideas from those who are debating tonight. And so let me allow you to uh, begin uh, your answer on the issue of security. As a lawyer, are you satisfied with the present structure of the country with <laughs> regard to the power of the state government to secure itself? If not, how do you hope to fix these in ensuring the safety of lives and property of your people? Thank you. I can assure you that I am not pleased with our security architecture in the country today. I am one of the strong advocates for multi-level policing and that we should, we should, the state, the country is right for it. I believe that to have a single command, for instance, for our police cannot ensure security we need. And for us as a state or state governors to be called the chief security officer without having powers, does not, it, it does not make sense. So that is one of the reasons that led to a number of us, those of us in Southwest, to create the Southwest uh, security network, which we christened Amoteku. And the idea really is this. Amoteku, as you know, is backed by law. And Amoteku has come to stay. And we are making a case that, look, we, as chief security officer, those that the Constitution has saddled responsibility for the security of lives and properties of people of our state, we have a stake, particularly when we have this challenge. And I believe that the police is sad with a lot of things. They might, it might be that the things are getting out of their hands. They don't have the number. So we are prepared as a state to add, to assist, so that we cooperate together and work together. And that's what the essence of Amoteku, that look, okay, in national security, Amoteku will be there to be part of security outfit to secure our people and their lives and properties, and we can be there, cooperate with the police, even the military, with the civil defense, and we are doing it. Amoteku, as you know, passing out, we have, those we train have passed out, and they have been working with other security outfits here. And immediately the issue of uh, community policing comes in, I think we can all work together. All right. 
Mr. Jagada, you have two minutes also. Same uh, question. Well, let me start first by saying that there must be a deliberate policy to strengthen the states. And if I may ask, if I may add this, to, a little, to weaken the center a little bit. Now, I believe in the state police, and I believe all our governors, all over the 36 states of the federation, should work together and ensure that we amend the constitution to allow the state police to operate. Now, having said that, what we have now, we must also work with it. The security architecture of the entire country is in a bad shape. And I believe that Ondo is also peculiar because of cases of kidnapping. What I would advise and what I believe should be done for us in PDP is that, first of all, we must ensure that we, bring, we build police outposts all over those vulnerable areas. Secondly, assist the military by using security funds to also build some small barracks all over the northern part of the state where you have a stark case of kidnapping. Thirdly, also ensure that we enforce the anti-kidnapping law and have in place the desire to be able to enforce these laws by bringing all corporates to book. The APC government in the center and the state have a big opportunity now to allow for the state police. Okay, uh, let me uh, follow up on, I think we have done it the best way. And what I know is that our record will speak for us, for, for us. The works we have done will speak for us. <coughs> we met here two mother and child hospital. Akure Anundu, we increased it to six. And seventh one has come up just last week. Mother and child hospital. That's an improvement. We, we met here a run down, totally run down medical services. We, there were no facilities in the hospitals. We went ahead and got to U.S., Mercia, bought equipment, everything worth about six million. And all of them have been distributed around. Now, when it comes to the issue of acquisition or all this, all this uh, blackmail that my, my, what do you call it now, my family running the state government, what this state should be proud of, what this state has today is an election of one and they have two. They have that price for the price of two. Because today they have in place an intelligent governor and an intelligent first lady. So there's no, we can't run away from it. It's two for the price of one. They don't all come easily. So when you have an intelligent first lady, there's no way it will not chart her own course. There's no way it won't decide to want to help uh, the widows. There's no way it won't decide to help those who have suffered from breast cancer, which have been at tough for long. So there's no way. Today he has produced solar gas. Today he has be more. It's because the product of intelligence. So the state today has just one election that has given them a price of two. And it's not easy to come by. And I'm proud of her. I'm proud of members of, of the First Lady for her work. Thank you so much. We take a break and when we come back, we will talk about health, education and the plans of the gentlemen on the stage. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Let's focus on the issues of health. Governor Kerdolu, I'll, I'll begin with you this time around. Uh, on the issue of education, similar question, but because you are a sitting governor, the question might be framed differently. Um, some schools in the state are now tagged elitist. What are you doing to correct these? Also, in the view of the presidential directive, raising the salaries of teachers, what do you hope to do in teachers' welfare? Let me start from the teachers' welfare. As if you were here, I, was, I had a forum which I had with teachers. We have no option. We will go along with the retirement age, which, the, which is uh, now being raised, and we will go along with what is contained in the welfare package. We have no option. We have always believed in it. I remember that one of the things the teachers raised here was a look. They have always had three tutors general in three central districts and they want an increase and a number of them have risen to that level to get to level to get to level 17 and i've said to them we will increase the number of tutors generals we have in the state that is for teachers and their welfare 
And and uh, for me, if I if I got your, if I can you give me the earlier part of your question? So I, I was asking about the fees and the increase in the fees, and um, some of the schools are being now tagged elitist because of the uh, the, the oh, okay, increase. Okay, 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 okay. I, I don't I don't see any school being termed elitist. I have argued that point. When we got here, we had my learned friend was attorney general. The fees in Unimed was 400,000. The fees in OSU Tech, that's Olusha Magagun University of Technology, was above 150. Nobody complained. Now, the concentration is in Akumba, and what we have done in Akumba is that we have said to the students, the least fees charged in any university, state university in Southwest, we will charge it. And that's what we have done. And they came in and worked at it and they said brought the details, all the facts, and we now did that. They accepted. It is not political time. Politicians are not talking about increase of fees. Right. I believe we have done our bit. Uh, Mr. Jagada, because you are not a sitting governor and you are the only one who have criticized uh, the sitting governor, the present administration, that the fees are too high. Considering the state of the economy and dwindling revenue, how do you hope to run the schools? And of course, uh, the other leg of that question is uh, the presidential directive, raising the salaries of teacher, teachers. What do you hope to do in teachers' welfare too? Well, let me start by trying to understand the position of Mr. Governor. I think it depends on priorities and what importance you place on education. Education is the mainstay industry of people like us in the Southwest. Between eight years before the governor came in, the tuition fee was 25,000 naira or 35,000 naira per session. In Akumba, for instance, which he has admitted. And that, those fees were maintained for those eight years. As soon as he came in, he increased the fees from 30 to 150. Again, I stand to be corrected. When we criticized it, he reduced it by 20,000, making it 130,000. And I stand to be corrected. Now, this, the, the, the summary I read of it is that for those who have four children in school, they are paying 25,000 naira for four children, will total 100,000. That payment for four children is now being collected for only one child, in fact, more for only one child. And what is the outcome? You have a number of our students now out of school. Two, you have a good number of them searching again for schools that collect lesser fees. Kogi, for instance, Kogi University, Anyiba, and then the Polytechnic in Ekiti, that are charging 45,000 naira. Now, what has happened is that the same government has now lost the revenue of those who have migrated from this school. So I go to the Polytechnic in Owo. Before now, you see a lot of activities in front of that Polytechnic photocopy machine, food industry, canteens, people carry on business. It's not like a ghost town. The reason is that the number of students have dwindled. And again, I stand to be corrected. The truth of it again is that teachers are not being encouraged because of non-payment of fees. Again, I stand to be corrected. In our polytechnic, I know that recently they were paid seven months salary. The time is up, Mr. Gegede. Thank you, uh, The other leg you were not able to answer, but I, I know Governor Akedulu wanted to rebut on that. You have a minute to do that. Thank you. Now, when my learned friend spoke about reduction, born out of criticism, whose criticism? Not him. Well, he did not see anything in the first instance for us. Now, the students were the ones that came. When the government council increased the fees, they came to me. And I invited the government council, and we met. The fees was reduced in the first instance. And students went to school, paid that fee for two years without complaining. Now, when I had a program on the television, the question was asked. And I said, look, where I am is simple. If the students can come up with any fee of any state university in Southwest that is lower than us, we will comply. And that's how we came about for that deduction. And the students are happy with it. So I don't see any problem in that. For me, the students are happy uh, and they're ready Governor to play. Let me allow Mr. Jagada to rest uh, your own minute, a minute for the rebuttal. Now, there should be no basis.
for the value of education to say that unless you find a state in the southwest that is charging lesser fees, you cannot charge lesser fees. No. Some governments have given us free education in the southwest of this country. And we have benefited from it. It was not that it was easy or it was easy to fund it. It is because you have to prioritize what one to think should apply as the greatest benefit for the greatest masses of the people. That's my answer. All right. So we've come to, uh, to the base of the, uh, the debate tonight, but we've come to the point where I'll allow both of you to ask questions and we have a minute to answer. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Jagade. You have, uh, uh, you're going to ask Governor Kredulu a question and you have a minute to answer. Please, go ahead. Well, this is a um, surprise. Uh, okay, let me, let me ask. So, Governor, will you be prepared to reduce the tuition fees to what operated before you came in, at least for university students? Well, it is something I believe this state cannot do. I am not prepared to do it because we have responsibilities and those responsibilities were put on us by the government to serve them. This state has no business having three universities at the same time. Today, if they were allowing 25,000 when they are two universities, when you now have three universities, it is a whole lot of responsibility. And I believe quite strongly for that matter that we have more than what we are two more than what we can buy, or we are buying more than what we can chew. Sorry for that. And for me, it is for the good of these people, of our people, that our students will go to university and have proper university education, not have great education, not one in which because you are paying students, you don't get proper education. We are giving them proper education. That's why today, Adekun Ajasi, that you are talking about, right. is the best university, like state you. university yeah. in Nigeria. You have an uh, opportunity now to ask him a question. Thank you. Well, Tayo, the yes. question I will ask you is this. You have toured around the state. And I want, to, I want you to be honest to the people. Have you not seen the impact of good governance in this state today, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of our primary schools, in terms of provision, provision of water, in terms of industrialization? That was not nowhere to be found before I came in. Have you not seen anything? Tell them. Unfortunately, minute, please. unfortunately, I have not seen much. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. I have not seen in Ilaje. I have not seen the infrastructure. I have not seen in Eseudo. I have not seen in Irili. Maybe in Apure. You have not seen I have not seen enough. I have not seen enough you have in Apure. You have not seen enough in Apure. All I can tell you is that I will do more than you, sir. Did you do that? I will do more than you. In your government, did you do that at all? Did I will do more than me. No, why are you? No, I don't know what you are. You said I should be honest. Eh? You said eh, you have no? not seen. I've pointed out to you so many places. Did you see Nikare? Or Okala Ibuzito? Did you see Apure? Where you are? Look, uh, Tayo. I, I intend, to, co I intend to complete your project, sir. No, you want to complete it, sir? He said you want to complete my project. What yes. I'm saying is this. Tayo, sir. in your own time, yes, sir. the road leading to your house was not tired. I tied it for you. I said, I don't. Oh, I've gone along. Did you see your road leading to your house? That road, that road, was, tired, that road was tired because your SA infrastructure leads on that road. Right. Your permanent SA yeah, leads on that road. For this, uh, but we need to go now. I tied the road for your you. SA. We're out of time. We're out of time. In charge of work. We're out to time. Just around that place. We need to go now. But let me allow. No, no, no. Seriously. He said because my essay, you live there. You're tired. No, no, no. Essay, you live there. I tied it. I tied it for you. No, I tied that road. No, no, no. Alakuni, Alakuni, sir. Egmo. We're out of time. Let me thank you. No, 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 sir. Mr. Mr. Jagere. We're out of time. No, let me thank you. We have got about 15 seconds for your closing statement. Yes. Now, I want our people in Ondo State to give us an opportunity to have a fresh face and fresh ideas. I concede that all governors have done their best. But most of the time, the best is not enough for our country, for our state. And what I bring on board is transparency, honesty, and readiness to work, and to open our state for all governance right. to all the people. And I will borrow his words. The government of the people, by the people, for the people. All right. All inclusive. Mr. Jagere, All inclusive. <laughs> thank you so much. Governor Akredulu, you have about 15 seconds for your closing thoughts. Thank you. Uh, what I call on our people is this. Today, the good works are there for you to see. We have done 
very well, and I can say that without blinking an eye, I am not blind. I can see the works you have done. Most of people in the state can see the works you have done. And some of them are not yet completed. And some have to be sustained. Sustainability right. is based on continuity. Uh, thank continuity you so much. is the key word. Mr. Jagada, thank you indeed for showing up tonight and uh, talking to the people of Ondo State. As we close this debate, I'd like both of you uh, in a show of friendship and uh, to elbow shake as we close this debate. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Okay. For coming. Okay. Okay. My friend. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Uh, on behalf of our partners, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. It's goodbye. What a kiss.